All right, well, after looking at these four moments of the aesthetic judgment, another question we might want to ask with regard to this is, what exactly is it that makes up these aesthetic judgments? I know that we've seen that they're uh, conceptless. They don't have to do with any particular thing we're thinking about. But clearly, we're, there's some kind of thinking going on. What, what is this kind of thinking in Kant's mind? When we make an aesthetic judgment, we come to sort of realize this aesthetic sensibility in a work of art or, um, or in some aspect of nature. What is it that we're recognizing? Well, Kant points out uh, two basic parts of of our aesthetic judgments. There actually are more than this in the entire critique of judgment when he talks about this, but there's two that are going to concern us in particular. And those are the beautiful and the sublime. What are these? Well, the beautiful for Kant is that sense of, of aesthetic delight that plays upon itself, that works upon itself, and seems to generate, as he says, a kind of a uh, bound and purposeful way of being, right? So it's, it's a way in which when we observe something that we come to recognize as beautiful, there's a way in which we look at, the, we look at something, let's say a sunset, right? Or we hear a symphony or we, we smell some sort of delightful scent coming from the kitchen. We have a sense of this, and these particular senses fit together to almost evoke something in our imagination, a sense of delight, a sense of wonder, a sense of some new and extraordinary way of being in which the senses combine with one another and bring out all of these possibilities inside of themselves. But this, this way of being, this, this new this new sensibility that we are calling beautiful, whether it's a beautiful scent or a beautiful sight or a beautiful sound or a beautiful thought or whatever it is, is bound. It has its own specific way of being, its own, its own kind of, if you like, inherent dignity to it, I guess. Um, this is, and this is important because this is a way in which this purposive purposelessness I was talking about in that third moment, right, of relation. This is how it comes about. It's its own special way of being in the world. This is what is meant by the beautiful for Kant. Now, beauty is only one dimension of this aesthetic, uh, what, what's, what's expressed or what's contained within uh, aesthetic judgment and artistic work, because in addition to that, there is another... Uh, feature, I guess, of aesthetic judgment that comes out that is just as moving, in some ways even more moving, and has powers that the beautiful doesn't necessarily have, but is uh, distinct in the way in which it stands in the mind. And that, of course, is what he calls the sublime. Now, the sublime, you, you this is a word that doesn't get used nearly so much. And when it does get used, quite honestly, it gets used in an awful lot of different ways. So it's not always it's not always easy to track exactly what it means. But with Kant, thankfully, the idea of the sublime is used in a relatively clear way because it's used in contrast to the beautiful. When Kant talks about the idea of the sublime, what he means is something that inspires a sense of awe, of dread, of wonder, of of overwhelmingness, right? Not beauty, not the sort of inherent dignity in which we have the senses sort of play upon one another, work on one another, and have a new idea emerge from it. Rather, there's a sense of boundlessness to this new sensibility that's been evoked. There's a way in which we don't know what its limits are, that we feel it going further beyond us than we can imagine or that we can even engage in, that there's a way in which it sort of supersedes us in some sense. So while beauty within the aesthetic judgment is bound, the sublime is boundless. It seems to go beyond the very nature of our judgment it itself and, and gives us from that a kind of awareness of both our own dignity and our own limitations. If you ask what is it that the sublime does in aesthetic judgment? You know what it does? It keeps us real. It makes us aware of ourselves. It gives us a, it gives us a sense of 
of ourselves in the face of this wonder, of this awe, of this terror, of whatever, whatever aesthetic experience, whatever aesthetic judgment is present to us. And it's, of course, because of this, a very, very important tool for artists and also for um, just for aesthetic judgments in general. Because if all there was was a sense of beauty, there'd be a way in which everything was, in some sense, I don't know, contained merely by our own possibilities. We might surprise ourselves, and I suppose delight ourselves, by these perpetual experiences of the beautiful. But we also wouldn't fully be ourselves, because part of the way in which aesthetic judgments become important, I suppose, is they remind us, they instruct us, they help us be more of what, for lack of a better word, more of what we are, finite beings, right, with a sense of greatness, a sense of limitation, a sense of aspiration, with strengths, with weaknesses, with failings, uh, with all the different dimensions of what it is to be human. And the sublime gives us a mirror, a mirror of the infinite, as it were, to begin to consider this. So rather lovely, I think. Um, I suppose one other thing I would want to bring up here, too, is the way in which the sublime and the beautiful are worked into works of art, um, and how Kant understands this. Now, when Kant talks about art, uh, Kant is, the word art itself is a rather broad term for him, because you can have art the way we, we often talk about it, like a painting or a piece of music or something, but you can also have arts like uh, the mechanical arts, you can have, uh, which could be something like, I don't know, computer programming, um, or perhaps uh, you can have the liberal arts. You know, it's just art is simply that which produces. It's artifice, as it were, right? That which, that which generates the artificial. And um, in that regard, there's a lot of different kinds of arts. But what Kant wants to say is that there is a particular kind of art, what he calls the fine arts that he distinguishes from other arts. He distinguishes it from craft, which he says has no particular intention to it. A craft is something that we simply do for, for, uh, uh, for its own completion without any sense of its own, this own internal dignity to it. And uh, a mechanical art, which has a, a dignity to it, but it's a dignity that is finished and perfect and just done and, and it sort of completes itself. The fine arts, on the other hand, take aspects that we encounter in nature, so things that we sense in nature, works them together without, and, and brings them to sort of reflect their own dignity, whether it's their own beauty that delights us and inspires us and moves us, or even a sense of the sublime, which uh, moves us to, to wonder and be awed by something and have a, this sense of ourselves. The thing about these fine arts that comes up with Kant is that the artist doesn't entirely seem to realize what it is exactly that they want to do. They have a sense of intention. They have a sense of where this can go, what this can be, what they might want to achieve. But there's also a way in which this art ha can generate entirely new ways of being. Um, without ever either A, showing the hand of the artist at work, so there's a seamlessness to it, and B, ever exhausting itself entirely. If you think about a great work of art, I mean, one of the things about art, I think, that, that becomes most interesting this way is that great works of art seem to have a capacity to almost live like a person, that there's a way in which they continue to mean, to express, to become. I know certainly my favorite works uh, seem to have, I, I, I find they have this quality. They change not just as I change, but seem to change almost themselves, like, like a person who I've come to know. Um, the capacity to do this, that is the capacity to generate a work in this seamless fashion that has its own dignity, that moves towards intention, but is never complete, never absolute, this, this is the mark of what Kant thinks of as genius. And it is the crowning feature of the fine arts. 
We're going to talk more about this later on in class, but I wanted to introduce that to you now.